Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and tonight I have the pleasure of introducing Mary Norris and Robin Black. Robin Black is the author of three books, including a short story collection, If I Loved You, I Would Tell You This, winner of the Philadelphia Athenaeum Literature Prize, and a novel, Life Drawing, an NPR Book of the Year in 2014. Her work has appeared numerous places, including the New York Times, O Magazine, Condé Nast Traveler, and the Colorado Review, where she is a contributing er editor. She begins teaching this coming fall in the Rutgers Camden MFA program. Her new book, Crash Course, Essays from Where Writing and Life Collide, is an examination of how life and art influence one another. As a three-decade veteran of the New Yorker's copy department, Mary Norris has had the task of maintaining the esteemed periodical's legendary high standards. In her best-selling book, Confessions of a Comma Queen, she brings her vast experience, wit, and red pen to bear in a raucous language book that was called Porn for Word Nerds in the Washington Post. The New York Times calls her the worldly aunt who pulls you aside at Thanksgiving and whispers that it is all right to occasionally flout the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in first welcoming Robin Black to the stage. Hi all, it is a, oops, I forgot, I have to stand back from this one. It's an absolute pleasure to be back at the Free Library, which is one of the mainstays of support for literature and authors in Philadelphia. And it is an honor to be appearing with Mary Norris, whose book I own, I think, three copies of. Um, but it was one of those that I, I ran out and bought the hardcover as soon as I saw what it was. So I'm excited to talk to her. My book is called Crash Course Essays from Where Writing and Life Collide, and it is a compilation of 43 very short essays which reflect my experience beginning to write in earnest in my early 40s and um, what it meant to me to come to that and how having lived that long and raised three children, writing, oh, thank you, <laughs> thanks. Um, for me, the act of the business of becoming a writer was inextricably intertwined with emotional development, with understanding what it meant to be middle-aged, with having three children, with various other personal experiences. And there really was no way for me to write a book that was either a memoir or about writing because they really coexist inside of me. So I'm going to read... Um, Maybe two essays. We're going to see how long the first one takes, though. And, and I think this first one gives you a kind of sense of the synthesis of craft and memoir that there is here. It's called The Final Draft, What's Love Got to Do With It? In 1993, my first marriage failed, eight years and two children in. And over the months, the years that followed, I took on a strange, unanticipated role advisor to the unhappily wed. How did you know they would quiz me at toddlers' birthday parties, at school assemblies? How did you know to end it, they would ask as we shepherded our power rangers, our witches, down dark suburban Halloween streets? How did you know when to call it quits? It didn't take me long to realize that I wanted no part in advising other people about whether or not to end their marriages. I had experienced too thoroughly the inability of any outsider to understand such a relationship, and I knew too well how much was at stake. But there was one piece of advice I always felt comfortable giving. If you decide to leave, I would say, be sure you can articulate to yourself exactly why you chose to go, because I promise you there will be times at which when you doubt your choice and you will need to have a very clear set of reasons to recite to yourself during those shaky days. That makes sense, they would say, disappointed, I knew, at the neutrality of my response. Soon enough, I remarried and people stopped thinking of me as a poster child for getting divorced when you have little kids. So I heard those questions less and less. But then I took up writing, then started teaching writing, and I began to hear other questions oddly resonant of those. How do you know when a story is finished? 
How do you know when it's time to send a story out? How do you know when to call it quits? It took me a while to realize that the answer I always give to this question is itself an echo of the other earlier one. I know a story isn't finished until I can explain to myself exactly why I have made all the craft choices I have made. Or to put it another way, if you plan on ending your relationship to a story and exposing it to the harsh gaze of those who didn't write it, you had better be able to articulate to yourself why you think it's time, because there are likely to be occasions when you doubt that you should have done so. I have long searched for any kind of scaffold on which I can hang an understanding of the role of intent in the process of writing, of how it evolves, ebbs, and flows, and finally dominates through draft after draft after draft. In the past, I've always told students that first drafts should be as much like vomiting as possible. But I think, and this is happy news for future students, that I will now start saying instead that first drafts are like falling in love, letting go, giving in, following a hunch, obsessing, hoping, fantasizing, knowing fuck all about what's going on. The vocabularies of early drafting and of nascent romance are essentially interchangeable. Even the presence of an irresistible erotic force connects the two. And mystery, it is all about mystery at the start. If we premise losing our hearts on our ability to explain doing so, we'd none of us ever lose our hearts. And for many of us, it's also true that if we stop too long to try and understand our early drafts, we may well find we have indeed stopped too long. At the start of both relationships, something bordering on lunacy is a necessary state. But then you show the story to a trusted reader who makes some imperfection in it clear. You introduce your beloved to your best friend and realize in her company that he laughs too loudly, too long at his own jokes. You approach the next draft with this flaw in mind, engaging your intellect exactly as you couldn't do while first drafting. You ponder if there is tact enough in the world to suggest to him that he not convey to others how amusing he finds himself. In writing and in romance, it is both impossible and inadvisable to maintain eternally the state of insanity necessary to get the thing going at the start. And the hope is, in both pursuits, that even that initial lunatic state will become a little less crazy with experience. The next time you meet a potential love, you may be a bit cannier about what endearing traits will ultimately drive you mad. And in writing, an analogous goal motivates us to study craft in the hope that some of it will become second nature even when we're in a fevered state. But the analogy isn't exact, of course. No genuinely helpful analogy or metaphor ever is. What would be the evocative power of comparing identical phenomena? Here, the comparison begins to fail around the word failure itself. When you leave a marriage, it is because it has failed. When you send a story out, it is because you believe that it succeeds. For better and worse, we have built into our cultural understanding of marriage that it isn't meant to be perfect, for better and worse, that it cannot be perfect, and that to insist on perfection is to doom the union. But writers do strive for perfection. Even those of us who know in our hearts that we'll never get it entirely right even those of us who claim to value a little mess in literature cherish fantasies of perfection while caught up in a piece, necessarily, I suspect, if quixotically too, that is, unless we let impatience rule the day. In the aftermath of my divorce, there were many occasions when I saw the pain it caused my children, and I needed that list of all the reasons it had been the right thing to do. My silent catechism got me through some very shaky times. But I wasn't always so fortunate or so prudent with my work. In that realm, I have been burned by cutting corners. I once sent out a story knowing, knowing that I didn't understand why I had ended it the way I had, and that it might well not be right, that it probably wasn't right. And that suspicion rubbed at me like sandpaper. But being new to the game and desperate for some success, I decided to take a shot anyway, and it was accepted for publication. 
When the journal arrived at my door, I wanted to rip the pages out. When friends told me they had read it, I wanted to apologize for all it didn't accomplish. When people praised it, I longed to explain why they were wrong. But then, as with old lovers who part too soon, only to meet again and make it work, I had the chance to rewrite that story for my book and give it the ending I could explain to myself, the one that justified my letting go. I could finally compose for myself a list of all the reasons behind the choices I had made. No, the analogy isn't perfect. But I see enough here, enough to build on, enough for sure to spare the next class of students that image of vomiting on the page, which always gets a good laugh, but also a recoil, and replace it with images of crazy, crazy, ill-fated love. <laughs> this book has, um, it has, as I think I said, 43 essays. Some of, they range from being two lines long to several pages. This is um, very short, but I'm just going to finish with this because I think it speaks to some of the writers in the room here. It's called The Art of Ripping Stitches. Lingering on various hard drives in my possession right now are the abandoned beginnings to at least 200 short stories. Some are mere opening lines, but several dozen stretch as long as 15 pages or more. 20 or 30 are fully drafted. I have just never been able to revise them to my own satisfaction. I may go back to one or two over time, but probably not. In other words, for every one of the 11 stories in my first book, I have started approximately 20 more. Which means that every time I begin a story, I do so in the knowledge that the odds are pretty slim I'll ever finish it, that the overwhelming likelihood is that I will work on it for days, even weeks, sometimes years, and then lose faith. I also have several dozen similarly abandoned essays, three novels that made it past the 50-page mark, and the big one, the 300-page novel that I worked on for four years, revised at least three times, may it rest in peace. I'm not sharing these gruesome statistics because I think I'm a special case, but because I think it's not all that far from the norm. We are all struggling here. We are all making false starts, falling in and out of love with our own words, facing hard truths about something we have labored on for what seems like an eternity. And we are all haunted by the belief that it's a whole lot easier for everyone else. A couple of years ago at a post-reading dinner, a well-known writer and I got to talking about how impossible it is to predict which of one's students will keep writing over time. I suggested that maybe success, defined as continuing to write, is determined by three things, talent, hard work, and good luck, and that without some of all three, it's very hard to keep going. My dinner companion added another. You have to be good at being a writer, he said. You have to be able to survive it all. The conversation moved on, and I can't remember if I ever asked him exactly what he meant, but I know what being good at being a writer means to me. Most obviously, it means being able to keep going in spite of the inevitable rejection from others. But perhaps more critically, it means being able to survive rejection from oneself, to weather the huge number of failed attempts and dashed hopes, the daily sense that one is not actually good enough to do what one so desperately wants to do. It means being able to wake up many mornings having disappointed oneself the day before and once again resuscitate the capacity to hope that this day's results will be different. And it means learning to recognize that every word one writes is just as important as every other word, that the words that make it out into the world cannot exist without those that came before, now lingering on a hard drive, abandoned. Process, 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 process. One of the wisest things ever said to me about writing was said to me about sewing. Years ago, when I wanted to make my own clothing, an older woman told me, if you're going to learn how to sew, you're going to have to learn to love ripping out stitches. Otherwise, you'll quit. I stopped sewing a quarter century ago, but I have never stopped reminding myself of that.
So it is my honor to invite Mary Norris up on the stage where um, she will read for us just a bit and then we're gonna have an interview and I'm hoping to pull you all in too because I'm sure you have a lot of questions for her. I had mentioned to Mary that there was a particular paragraph I was gonna ask her about first and then I asked her if she could read a little of it. Um, so I'm just gonna let her do that and then we'll talk about it some. Okay, this is from a chapter titled that witch. <laughs> I always forget that in the popular imagination, the copy editor is a bit of a witch. And it surprises me when someone is afraid of me. Not long ago, a young editorial assistant getting her first tour of the New Yorker offices paused at my door to be introduced. And when she heard I was a copy editor, she jumped back <laughs> as, as, as if I might poke her with a red-hot hyphen, or force feed her a pound of commas. Relax, I wanted to say. I don't make a habit of correcting people in conversation or in print, unless it's for publication and they ask for it, or I'm getting paid. We copy editors sometimes get a reputation for wanting to redirect the flow, change the course of the missile, have our way with a piece of prose, the image of the copy editor is of someone who favors a rigid consistency, a mean person who enjoys pointing out other people's errors, a lowly person who is just starting out on her career in publishing and is eager to make an impression, or at worst, a bitter, thwarted person who wanted to be a writer and instead got stuck dotting the I's and crossing the T's and otherwise advancing the careers of other writers. I suppose I have been all of these. <laughs> Thank you. I will confess I met Mary at um, this giant conference uh, about 10 days ago and I knew a gentleman who was who knew her and they were at the same booth and I said to him exactly that. I said Oh God, I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna split an infinitive, and she won't want to appear with me in Philadelphia. So um, I probably Chill. did. But my question about this really goes to that last passage you read, which is the sort of the evolution of becoming what you are now. And maybe you could explain first what your position is now, and then a little bit about how you discovered this capacity in yourself or the enjoyment of this? Okay, well, I started out at the New Yorker in an entry level position in the editorial library where we took apart the magazine, literally, with razor blades and pasted these columns into the, uh, these big black scrapbooks that every writer had. And we also took it apart figuratively, indexing the articles, the cartoons by subject and by artist. And that was in case anyone who wanted to know when a cartoon that they remembered ran, and they could call the library and say, it was about this bird that laid a square egg. <laughs> and we, we would have that under birds, and we could find it for them. <laughs> so, so that was a fun job, especially at, at first I was writing a thesis a master's thesis on James Thurber. Um, so I had access now to all of this, these uh, scrapbooks with his unpublished work in them and spot drawings and things. But I got bored there after a while and I wanted to help put the magazine together. So I clawed my way up to the job of copy editor and I was there, I was there for quite a while when I found out that men in the editorial on the editorial staff had started there. It took hmm. me four years to get someplace where, you know, somebody from University of Texas just walked in and sat down, you know. <laughs> so anyway, um, <laughs> no bitterness. Not there. that she has any strong feelings about that. Um, it was an interesting job starting out. When you're on the copy desk, it's a little bit different from what I do now. You, you do only the most mechanical things. You just fix spellings, you change spellings to New Yorker style, you know, double the L and traveler, and put in the, the famous diarysis, the two dots over the second O and cooperate. 
is a sort of job now. It's good for keeping people off the streets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did that for years, and I did finally get bored with that. I mean, it was a great job. I was doing, we had a night shift, so I could take courses during the day. I studied um, ancient Greek on New Yorker time, <laughs> and they paid for it, believe it or not. Um, and then I had time to write. I'd always wanted to be a writer, and I had thought when I came to the New Yorker that that's what I'd do, that I could write talk stories and the talk of the town. And it turned out that it was not that much of a help, I don't think, to have a foot in the door as a staff member. It must have been some help, uh, but still, they don't publish something just because they run into you at the elevator. You know, it doesn't work like that. So I actually left. This is a part that gets left out of my biography because it doesn't really fit in anywhere. But I got bored with that copy desk job, and the magazine had changed owners, it had changed editors, and it wasn't the same place that I would started out in. And I went to a startup magazine called Wigwag, which lasted for two years and folded, and then I freelanced. And when my freelance work was mostly coming from the New Yorker, I <laughs> went back there. <laughs> and I, when I came back, it was at a different level. It was at the level of what we call a page okayer, or a query proofreader. So it's not just mechanical. If you see a split infinitive, you can decide whether to query that or not, whether most writers, if they split an infinitive, they did it on purpose. What I have discovered is if they don't split an infinitive, you don't split it for them. Mm. That's, that's mm -hmm. the wrong thing to do. Um, but I, I got to work more closely with editors and writers and the fact checkers, and I like this job more. Mm -hmm. But all the while, I was writing. I wanted to be a writer. I mm -hmm. didn't want to be a copy editor, and I had hopes. I wrote a novel when I was on the copy desk. It was about somebody who worked at a magazine and took language classes. <laughs> <laughs> I did find a, I had a, an agent, but we did not succeed in placing it anywhere. And I wrote, I, I wrote, um, I got the material for a book about nuns. I had gone to school during Vatican II, and the nuns came out of their habits and changed back to their baptismal names, and I thought there might be a book in that. And I, 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 I was very bad. I didn't know how to go about doing this, but I wrote to one agent who a friend recommended, and she got back to me about a year and a half later and said that she didn't think she could take on a book about nuns. And that was it. I never <laughs> went any, any further with that idea. I wrote, I kept a blog about parking on the street in New York City. I got so desperate to be published, I thought, oh, I'm just going to put it out there myself. You know, somebody talked me into that. And then I was working on a memoir. I have a transgender sibling, and I thought this will be my great work. Um, after I'd adjusted to having a transgender, to having a sister instead of a brother, and I was not angry at her anymore, I was able to write this memoir, and I was trying to place that, and it had gotten turned down by an agent, and that's when I was sitting at my desk, and somebody from the New Yorker's web department came to the door and asked if I would write uh, a defense of the New Yorker's comments because somebody had made fun of them in, um, in the New York Times by the name Ben Yagoda. And I was just, I was appalled. You want me to write about comma? You know, so, but then I, I, I realized that I should know something about commas. I'd been on the copy desk. I'd been copy editing and proofreading for 30 years. And I was also the holder of the comma shaker. We have legendary, there's a legendary proofreader who, who, had, who made this, um, it was a, one of those perforated tins, like the pizza place, and she'd wrapped paper around it and drawn commas on it. And she thought we used too many commas. She was paid to enforce that rule, but she didn't like it. So she, her, her idea was that when, just before going to press any piece of the New Yorker, you stop it to shake in the commas <laughs> just before it goes to the printer. So that gave me an in to write this piece about commas. And that, I never would have expected to get a book out of my day job, mm. never, never. But it just worked out that people were interested in, this, in these things. The New Yorker had always had a mystique about its copy editing practices. Mm -hmm. We would never talk about them. And now I've found out why. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it occurred to a few people 
pretty soon that there might be a book in it. And so I wrote about all these language things. Never thought it would be my subject, never. Well, it's, um, I love the part in the book where you're sitting there waiting for a parking space. I should have known that there was a, a deeper level of interest in that because it's such a great <laughs> scene. And then you notice someone has actually, I think the word you use is skunked you and taken, taken them on. If that wasn't your word, I take it back. <laughs> but um, I was drawn to the book initially because the title Between You and Me touches on one of my pet peeves, which is the between you and I, or they gave it to you and I. And, and I will tell you that I actually had the experience, which I think is, is very much of the time, of the decade, of sending something to a magazine that was correct and having them send it back to me as the captain handed it to my husband and I. And it was pretty late in the process, and I had this absolute terror that it was going to go out that way, and people, you know, it was just horrible. So my question is, do, is there for you a sort of hierarchy of things that bug you about this? <laughs> you know, this is probably pretty high up, is my guess. Yes, there is a reason the book is called Between You and Me. Um, my hope, that is the thing that, that grates on my ears when I hear it. And I, I, I did my best just by titling the book that to you know give people this clue. <laughs> <laughs> but it occurs all over the place, and the more people hear it, the more you know that it, it seeps in. There are a couple of examples in the book. There are loads of examples in the book, um, but people accepting Academy Awards will say. Such an honor! I can't thank you enough for for introducing Sally and I. You know. <laughs> I was actually very pleased that you dinged our president on this. I'm a fan of our president, except for that. <laughs> yes, um, he's so well spoken. Otherwise, and his wife Michelle has no problem with saying the right thing. She's, she's, she's a, for Barack and me. You know. And that's the whole, what I, um, I'm asked about this on uh, radio interviews a lot. And if, as soon as I say anything technical, like nominative and accusative, I can just hear radios turning off. <laughs> so, so I always fall back on explaining it by saying, if you just put yourself first, you'll see what, how it should be. You would never say between I and you. So I said, go ahead and say between me and you. That's even better than saying between you and I, and switch it around, and you can have it both correct and polite. Um, but that's the problem when people get in, when, when it's a compound, the king and I. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that, that, I, that I am still bothered by, this is one of the um, crucial issues in grammar and usage today, is what they call the singular there. Mm -hmm. By calling it singular, they hope to make it legitimate, I guess. But this you hear in conversation all the time. You know. Would everyone please take their seat? Everyone is singular, there is plural. And it's, it's accepted, it's said all over, it's gaining acceptance. They're starting to put it in the newspaper. The Washington Post just accepted it as calling it singular there. But I can't help it, it bothers my ears. Yes? Oh, good. <laughs> the right crowd is here tonight. <laughs> that, of course, is probably something that you end up spending a lot of time talking about, I would think, just even at the office, which is the question of usage changing. And I, I'm very curious with somebody who does this professionally, and I gather from your book with a great deal of passion also, how do you strike that balance? I mean, I have waged what I call the Facebook grammar wars, where I put things up like, you know, my husband and I, that kind of thing. And somebody will always, you know, it's always reliably no more than three comments down. Somebody will say, but English language evolves. So I'm, I'm interested in how someone in your position views the difference between evolution and devolution in this stuff. Well, it is an interesting position to be in because writers are in the vanguard with new usages. I think especially writers of fiction. And we have to decide each time, each word as 
it's a case-to-case -case basis. And it's not a matter of permitting it. Um, it's always a matter of questioning and suggesting alternatives and just making sure with the writer that that's what he or she wants. And it, it's, well, it's interesting because some of the writers certainly know what they want and will, will fight. And it, you know, it's, it never has, it rarely gets a, oh. <laughs> um. I love that edit from never <laughs> to rarely. <laughs> Hardly I have, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I have a rule if I, if I query something. I will query it once. We read things in galley, so it's not going to press quite yet. You have a chance to read it. And, and then when you read it again in the page layout and it hasn't changed, I'll query it once more. And then when it comes back, the final proof before it goes to press and it still hasn't changed, that's when we have a meeting over these, I mean, not, not because it hasn't changed, but our system <laughs> is that before things go to press, um, the page okayer, the fact checker, the editor, and the author sit down together and discuss page by page any further refinements. And that's when I will bring it up a third time and I'll get an answer. No, you're, you know, they never really insult me, but they do. We prefer it the way it is, it would be. They, he, or, um, if the author isn't there, the editor is in, engaged in this game of good cop, bad cop. You know, I told her that's how it should be, but she resisted. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I've done my job if I've suggested something three times. Um, as far as new words entering the language? New words, new usages. Mm -hmm. I mean, Things like the there you spoke about, but um, I'm trying to think of some of the others that irritate me, where I'm basically told you're an old fogey and this mm. is just what language is now. Well, the one that stopped me not that long ago was Hella. It was in a piece by a California writer. It was a, a Hella party, and I get it. I know it's <laughs> short for Hellava, and it means well, I'm not quite sure. Of <laughs> but but I let that go. You know, I mean, I, I let it in. And, um, and then, of course, what happens, whether this slang will, will become part of the language or whether it will fade, we can't know. Only time will tell. But there's a citation in the New Yorker now for Hella that could be on file at Merriam-Webster. So it, when we do that, we are legitimizing. I got a sense throughout the book of a, a kind of um, <coughs> maybe in, in the age of Twitter, we would call them sort of Twitter happy people who are following everything the New Yorker does along these lines, um, whether it was initially letters or now they're tweeting about it. But it seemed in the book that there's a very kind of robust relationship between specifically your department and these people who are, to my eye, kind of obsessing over things like how the New Yorker spells things. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, because some of the letters that come in are fascinating. Actually, the letters, whenever I um, have to do a lecture or something, or, or talk at, in somebody's English class, I fall back on the letters because they are priceless. <coughs> and I should have brought some, but people, always write in. When I had an excerpt from my book ran in the New Yorker about a year ago, and I had the audacity to end a sentence with a preposition. <laughs> I think that also had a split infinitive. I used two prepositions in a row, and she got out of town, or I don't know, but somebody, you know, it's amazing what people object to. Well, that's, to. that's, I mean, it's also amazing what people have time for. <laughs> well, <laughs> The form letter for these letters should really just say, get a life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let it go at that. And it is interesting that they are more correct than we are. They are. Um, readers are just appalled at how our standards have slipped. And um, they think there's never been a typo in the New Yorker before. And oh, I would love to you know, promote that illusion. But it is just that, it's an illusion. There have always been mistakes in the New Yorker. This idea people have that there aren't, keep that. 
keep that in mind because that will prevent you from seeing the mistakes. But it's just, it, <clears throat> I'm not going to mount a defense. Um, but we get tired, things slip by. Nobody ever writes about how many words we spelt right. <laughs> <coughs> In the passage you read, and also throughout the book, this is a, a theme that comes up, um, the business of trying to help mm -hmm. reveal the writer's true voice or sort of um, enlarge their presence rather than combat it. And I was wondering, as you did this over time, if there was an evolution in you that way, whether you started out sort of seeing yourself as the person who would make the writers write properly and if there's been a change over the years? Well, actually, when I, when I started out, I was in a department called collating. Um, just before I was on the copy desk, this was part of my progress up the ladder. Uh, collating, we took the changes from the checker, two proofreaders, the author and the editor, and we put them all, all the accepted changes were put on one proof, clean proof with the printer. And there were, I always used to wonder, why can't that guy learn how to spell annihilate? <laughs> and those kinds of things that you would think a writer when he read the piece the next time, because they read their pieces over and over again, would notice that annihilate had those two ends this time, but no. <laughs> and <clears throat> all those kinds of mistakes. But that's not the writer's job. I finally figured that out. And there would be no place for me for the copy editor, if that was the writer's job. <laughs> and I don't know, I think, well, there's a story in the, in the book. I mean, you, you want to be a bit of a savior when you're the copy editor, the proofreader. You know, it would be a good feeling to save someone from a horrible mistake. And there was one time on the copy desk when I came to a <clears throat> an expression that John McPhee used. He wrote that some kind of geological phenomena were new and far between. And I wanted so bad to change that to few and far between, as if John McPhee would type <laughs> an N when he meant an F. Um, and I, I practically had to sit on my hands not to change that. And I got, <clears throat> I got out of the office without changing it. And as soon as I got out of the office, I realized, well, of course he meant what he wrote. He meant new and far between. So I try always, always to give the writer the benefit of the doubt. Somebody might come along behind me and say, you missed this. What kind of an idiot are you? And I say, well, I just wanted to make sure, you know, so. None of the inquiry reporters seems to know that none is singular. I don't know where they went to school, but is this fairly common? Uh-oh. <laughs> Have you written letters lately? <laughs> <laughs> um, we now treat none as plural. <gasps> the only time that we treat it as a singular is if there's a really strong emphasis on its meaning not a single one. Not a single one of those inquirer reporters knows that none is singular. <laughs> is that how that would go? <clears throat> Most of the time, none just means not, not any, and so we treat it as plural. Um, yes. <laughs> well, you can all say you went home, you had learned something, for sure. <clears throat> In light of the transgender uh, growth that is happening today, what do you see happening with pronouns? With what? The pronouns. use of pronouns. He, she. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's one of the other meanings of the singular they. The transgender, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what the, there's not a lobby. Transgender people want their own, they, they'd rather not be known as he or she or if it's some blend of he and she uh, or neither he nor she, that they be the pronoun that the, such people are identified by. And I understand that in universities, which the hotbed where most of this stuff comes from, and, and it will happen, um, you can choose, you know, there's not just male or female boxes mm -hmm. to check. 
there one place has like 11 different blends that I you can have. Think, I think Facebook has it <coughs> has something like 30 possible gender identities. And then you can also select which pronoun you want to be known by. And they is the most popular. There is um, there are there is a whole list there you know this is something that's missing in the English language anyway both for grammatical number and the gender thing has really only come up within the last say 20 30 years but very much so in the past five I think mm -hmm. and I have this transgender sister and when I I did not want to include anything about her in the book because she wanted to be able to read the book you know <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want you know her to have to read things about herself that she wasn't expecting to see. Um, but we had a discussion about it. It was all right with her as long as I avoided certain combinations of words. And by the time I wrote the book and it came out and then it got um, republished as a paperback, the language of transgender matters has changed. So you know it's it's impossible to keep up with. But basically, my feeling about it is that you should call people what they want to be called. I had a very hard time adapting to my sibling's preference to be she and using her and hers um, because I'd used the, the masculine pronouns all my life. But I, it's, it, it is so important to them. And Dee was so sensitive about it that I, you know, I saw that I had to make the effort. So that's what I'm saying, is make the effort and call people what they want to be called. It seems like almost, you know, possibly a unique case mm -hmm. of language evolving, you know, in such a basic place as a pronoun for a purpose, <coughs> you know, that we're all conscious of, that as a society we're sort of saying, okay, we're going to change how we mm -hmm. use this word. That I can't think of another, I mean, aside from, you know, terrible slurs and things that get cut out. The only thing I can think of offhand is Ms. Mm -hmm, right. um, Ms. existed for a long time, and Ms. is it's the title of a magazine. But Ms. came in pretty fast, it yeah. seemed to me. You know, pretty soon, you had a we had three boxes to check: Miss, Mister, all four, Mrs. or Ms. You got your choice. So that happened, and once it gets rolling, it can actually happen pretty fast. <coughs> On the subject of um, indicating sex in a sort of generalized uh, setting. What does the New Yorker do in terms of he, she, and how is that made more complicated now? Or I, I guess what I'm saying is I feel like one of the wonderful things about um, so many categories broadening is that it brings new reasons to think about things like that. Well, what we've done at the New Yorker is, um, you know, it's a very conservative force on the language. It's a very conservative um, use. And we have writers who uh, still always use what we call the masculine, what do they call the universal masculine or something, that it's always he or him. And that's, um, that it has always been that way. It was always that way. And and people who learn that rule early on still write that way, and they don't want you changing it. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I personally like to throw in feminine pronouns. I think that's a, a good thing for women to do sometimes, and I've noticed that more and more men, are, male writers, are actually doing that, and I applaud that. The his or her, he or she, if it is not awkward and the writer does it, herself, um, then that's fine. I think that it's fine, certainly, if, if it comes from the writer. And about, we still avoid the everyone took their seat, everyone had their opinion, and we will rewrite that. We will say everyone thought something different, or um, all the people there had their own opinion. We'll, we'll change the antecedent to make it plural. And all those things have to go by the writer. The writer has to approve them. And I'm so surprised sometimes that somebody not long ago um, 
George Saunders actually changed uh, there. You know, everyone had their own opinion to a his. And it seemed, uh, he, he's, a, he's male, it seemed, and the person who was talking was, was um, had a traditional background, so it seemed like the right thing to do, and I was just really relieved that he was willing to do that. <laughs> so everything, it's, it's on everyone's minds. And there are people, not at the New Yorker yet, but there are people in the copy editing world, and certainly in the linguistic world, who think that I'm just, that we're all wasting our time worrying about this and we should just use their, because that's how it's going to fall out in the end. And you know, they're, they're right, I think, but once you've gone that far, you can't go back. And you can always go that far when the time comes, but you know, it's like getting up from crawling to walking. You can't go back to the crawl. On that subject, Mary, I'm with you on the, you know, himself or herself, I think is really, I just can't stand it. I mean, he or she, <laughs> and, and, and there I really can't stand. I, I've been sort of using oneself or, you know, ones. I, I know that sounds so 20th century, but I don't know what else to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I often forget to suggest oneself, but the fact is it's stiff. Mm -hmm. It just sounds too stiff, and if you use it, You'll, you'll see how stiff it is as soon as you try to use it. In a very formal context, it might work. Yeah. It's also, I mean, I find that using one or oneself works if the word appears once, but if you're winding your way through a paragraph where you're repeating some form of it over and over again, you just sort of sound like a fool. It makes you more and more distant. Yeah. <laughs> it, and you begin to think, it begins to sound like you're referring to yourself. You know, oneself <laughs> is sitting here right now. That, that reminds me of the other pet peeve I was trying to think of, which is um, my daughter, myself, and I are going to the movies. That one. You don't, yeah, I mean, people probably don't even run that one across your <laughs> desk. <laughs> well, I get a lot of suggestions for um, things I should write about. And one of them is the reflexive pronouns, mm -hmm. myself and himself. And I'm sure that all you people know that the, reason, the use of the reflexive is not just as a pronoun, and, and probably is, has Obama done this one too? Michelle I and think myself. He has. Well, I actually <laughs> think he did recently. Well, that's how we're going to vote. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a test. Mary, could you talk about something that is much worse? Because these discussions have a legitimacy to them, they're nuanced. But what about? things like using apostrophes to make plurals, which seems a very common thing. You can't walk down the street without seeing a sign in which an apostrophe is used to make a plural. Now, there's no legitimate reason one could put forth, but where does that come from, and, and what do you think will happen with that sort of problem? I, I just have to say, before she answers, there's quite the section on that in this book. <laughs> the apostrophe section was the hardest to write about because it's so simple, right? And then you hit the exceptions. And then, then whatever you said was simple doesn't seem very simple anymore. I, have a, I had a big mistake in my apostrophe section. The, the problem with possessives, um, it's the letter S, the letter S has to do this double duty as forming a plural and forming the possessive. And you know, it seems simple enough to have a singular noun with a possessive as just apostrophe S. If it ends in S, you've got a little bit more of a problem. I don't, I just put another apostrophe and an S on it. But a lot of people I've noticed when in my name when it's in print as Norris's book, they will often leave off that extra S. So that and that turns out to be legitimate. I found it in Chicago Manual of Style. Um, it's another thing I choose not to do, but, but I no longer find fault with people who do that. But that thing, the apostrophe used to form a plural, is just a, um, <clears throat> it's a mistake of people who wish they knew how to use apostrophes. <laughs> So it's, it's sort of an aspirational <coughs> apostrophe? It's what um, Lynn Trust called the grocer's apostrophe, you know. <laughs> Banana apostrophe S, 20 cents a pound, that sort of thing. Um, 
I'm, just, I'm sure every writer has intense fear about letting a book be published and waiting for that moment between the galley and when it comes out. Did you have extra fear given the, you know, worrying about like if you put a comma in the wrong place or any of those um, types of grammatical issues? Mm. Yeah, we were talking about this just um, backstage. We both had that fear and Robin said exactly that. You must have been extra afraid. I had this, of course I proofread it myself, but you can't you're not the best judge of your own book. You, you, you just have to have somebody else do it. My publisher had a freelance copy editor go over it. My boss at work read it for me in return for a steak dinner. And then there was a final proofreader at the publisher, and yet the book was riddled <laughs> with errors. Um, and I mean, Especially, I, it's kind of easy to understand in hindsight, the chapter on profanity, <laughs> there, that had the only garbled sentence in it, a total garble in a sentence, and then it had a word spelled wrong, der, derives was spelled dervies, and it took somebody in Australia to recognize that, and we fixed that. <laughs> but, so I thought there were, anyway, there were little mistakes like this all through, I, I made a reference to Becky Thatcher when I meant Becky Sharp. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it is so embarrassing. There is something in these circles called Muffrey's Law. Whenever you write something about usage, it is guaranteed to have a mistake in it. Guaranteed. So that, mis that sentence that had the word dervies in it, fix that, and then somebody I shouldn't even tell you this because you'll read right over it. I don't tell you. The very same sentence had linguistics spelt without the second I. <laughs> um, so Somehow it's this fraught. is making me it's feel just... better. Oh, good. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know good. why, but it's, it's helping. <laughs> I'm one of these people with too much time. Does the New Yorker use the words gender and sex interchangeably? I could tell by the bow tie that your question was going to be <laughs> No. No, um, that's something that, again, is in flux. But sex is definitely male or female. Gender is masculine or feminine. And um, I have, I've, I've made a study of this. Um, but it's very hard now to use the, the word gender has crept in and taken over in a lot of places where we used to use sex. But now, somehow the word sex looks very bald. <laughs> <laughs> and there is more of a tendency to, to use gender. Mary, do they um, let you stick your nose into the cartoon captions or do they keep you out of there? They try to keep us out of there, but we go anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There, that is the source of most of the, the, the fights. There was, um, there was one not long, mostly I don't have to do that. The head of the department takes care of the captions and she mainly lets the cartoon editor have his way because you know the basic rule is whoever feels strongest wins and he feels really strong. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but there was one where, for some reason, he just wanted to take out what I think of as the evocative comma, you know. Check it out, guys. Um, I've got my wine legs. That was the cartoon, I remember it now. And the joke was the wine legs, but for some reason, he didn't want to take out, I know exactly the reason, but check it out, comma, guys. He did not want a comma in there. And he explained that captions, cartoon captions are dialogue, like a play. And that he explained, a comma <laughs> is a pause. And you know, I was just furious. <laughs> you do not have to explain this to me. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but then I had to explain in turn that anyone who saw that in the New Yorker would think it was a mistake if we left that comma out and that it doesn't mean you have to stop and gasp for breath every time you come to a comma, you know? So those are the kind of arguments we have over the captions. 
Uh, I greatly appreciated the um, chapters on commas and hyphens. And I think somewhere in those sections, you have um, a discussion about merging two words to become one. Um, a, a couple examples I remember are hairstyle, lifestyle, um, and some of my own examples are website and timeline. And I'm wondering, um, what does it take, if there are any examples, for the New Yorker to merge two, ones, two, two words to become one? And if there are very little example of examples, what is the resistance there? That's an interesting question. Um, <coughs> the people on the website, capital W-E-B space, S-I-T-E, <laughs> want us to lowercase it and put it together. And the only reason that we keep it the way it is now is that that's how it is in Webster's. Mm -hmm. And that's our source. So um, when Webster's changes it, we'll change it, I suppose. But there's also the word teenage, with the New York, which the New Yorker still hyphenates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people make fun of that. Um, and I tried to get to the bottom of it. Obviously, teenage is one word in the most recent Webster's. But in Web, Webster's Second International, which is our second recourse when we're spelling word, teenage without a hyphen is spelt it, it means something completely different. It's pronounced teenage, <laughs> and it's some kind of stuff they use to make fences. <laughs> it's like a weaving term. Oh, let's tighten up the teenage there. <laughs> so so I, my only defense of the hyphen in teenage is that, well, we wouldn't want anyone confusing it with <laughs> teenage, would we? It takes, finally, at the New Yorker, what it takes. The, the copy desk, we're perfectly happy to keep things just as they are. Um, but if, a, if an editor or a writer says, you know, gets really, as I said before, whoever feels strongest about this is going to win. If some editor or writer gets really upset and thinks you're, this is just ancient, you're going to looking antiquated, we have to change this, finally it'll, the dam will burst and it will change. Well, I think on that note of change and hope for change, um, <laughs> that is going to be it for tonight. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Mary, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, pleasure. for sharing your big day.